welcome you and um, begin by just making a quick reference to um, the reveal uh, survey that we have um, being uh, kind of taken on all the various campuses uh, in Greenland, in Kittery, in Raymond, all of us together participating in this spiritual survey that is um, really designed to give each and every one of us a little snapshot into where we are in our, in our faith journey, but also the collective experience so that everybody can um, share their thoughts and um, uh, share with one another some of those opportunities that have helped them to grow spiritually. And so we have, uh, as, a, as a church, um, decided that this would be a good way to uh, kind of build a benchmark for us so that we could now then begin to um, gather all that information and have that inform some of the decisions that we're going to make regarding our next steps and how we can come along people in our congregation all along this faith journey. So if you haven't taken it yet, we'd like for you to take that uh, survey. It's as simple as just taking out your phone and taking a picture of the, the QR form. We have these little packets that we have uh, designed for everyone to just have a little snack, sit down, 15, 20 minutes, and uh, you can complete the survey. It's also available on our website. Um, so you just go to bethanychurch.com, and you can uh, find a link there that would help you to uh, take that survey. So why don't you uh, now just join with me in a, in a word of prayer as we, we get ready to open up the Word of God together. Father, we are grateful for a gospel that you give us that challenges us on multiple levels. It calls for our attention. It, it asks us, Lord, to uh, reflect not only on the state of the world, but also the state of our own heart to make sure that um, we're not guilty at always pointing out the faults of those around us or with the world as a, as, as a whole, but rather we are taking that reflective look to see how our lives are really reflecting something of your goodness and of your grace. That challenge, Lord, is always before us and will be, Lord, until we see you face to face. So help us to run this race without becoming weary. Help us to fix our eyes on Jesus and run with greater endurance. May this hope that Jesus has provided us really speak into our lives and cause us, Lord, to um, meet the challenges of the day with a, with a, a deeper sense of commitment and a, um, and a boldness that can only be accounted for because the presence of your spirit is in us. Lord, when we come, we can, we can be experiencing all kinds of trials and temptations. Sometimes we can be in a very public place and people on either side of us are not even aware of the struggles that are going on inside. But you do. And by your spirit, Lord, you say that you bring peace that passes all of our understanding. So I'm asking, Lord, that as a result of our time that we spend together, as we open up this word, as we become more and more acquainted with who Jesus is, and, and, um, and this work, Lord, that, that he has accomplished on our behalf, that it would strengthen us in the inner man so that we can meet the challenges of the day. And as always, Lord, we'll be careful to give you all the praise for what you are doing in and through us. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We are in the midst of a study on a topic that we have titled Misunderstood. We, we gave it this title because of uh, the reality from Matthew chapter 14 through verse six, uh, chapter 16 that there are varied responses that people are giving to this ministry of Jesus. They are missing out on the opportunity really to know him, and they have begun to really harden their hearts against him, 
making all kinds of decisions that um, really show themselves to be more and more at odds with this ministry of Jesus. Um, they are not convinced. They seem to be less and less curious and more and more combative. And the result of that is you can begin to see the schism that is taking place. Uh, over the past few weeks, we have seen that reach a height, right? Jesus coming into his own hometown and the people not receiving him, looking at him with suspicion and um, perhaps with a... Uh, a uh, a deep-seated uh, seated sense of, um, of envy, jealousy. They, they look at Jesus and they say, like, like, basically, who do you think you are? We, we know where you come from. We, we know your, 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 your mother, Mary, she lives here. Your, your brothers and sisters, they're still here. So don't, don't try to act like you're better than all the rest of us. And what does Jesus reply? He just, he tells them, he says, look, a prophet is not without honor except in his own household. And he refused to do any miracles in Capernaum. Delegations from Jerusalem would come to visit him. And again, they are challenging Jesus' authority. And Jesus uses that as an opportunity to demonstrate to them where this path to godliness really is going to lead. It's not about managing all of the externals. It's always about managing the condition of one's heart. Jesus says it's not what goes into a man that defiles him, but what comes out of his mouth comes from his heart. And from one's heart comes all kinds of evil thoughts and murders and slander, immoralities and adulteries. See, Jesus understood that we all need a renovation of the heart. The Pharisees, the teachers of the law that had come up from Jerusalem, they wanted to debate on the finer points of their own oral traditions. And Jesus is just pointing them back again to the reality that we are sinners in need of God's grace. And if we don't really come to terms with that, then it's always going to be about managing the outside. And um, it's never really going to reach deeply into the condition of one's heart. So Jesus leaves this whole region, right? And he does something that is kind of strange. He winds up going to this region of the country up near Sidon and Tyre, Seacoast towns on the, on the seacoast of the Mediterranean. And that, that's Gentile territory. The, the, the Jews had now begun to demonstrate a, um, a reluctance. The, the, the spiritual leadership now are, are, are coming up against Jesus. And uh, so... He goes to the seacoast of the Mediterranean Sea, and there he's encountered by a Canaanite woman, and he winds up commending her faith and healing her daughter. He leaves that region, and he goes back again eastward to the Sea of Galilee, and there again in a Gentile territory, feeds 4,000 who had come to See if Jesus would heal their sick, the blind, the lame, right, the mute. And Jesus does for this Gentile community the same things that he has been doing for the family of Israel. No difference. Down to even the breaking of bread and multiplying miraculously a feeding for all those who had come to, to hear him. And the bottom line of that is for us walking away and recognizing that Jesus is not a respecter of persons. Jesus has come as Savior of the world, both for Jew and for Gentile. Jesus is the one who is transcending all these barriers that we raise up of nationality and, and race and, and, and creeds. No, no, Jesus is embracing everyone. And it should also tell us 
that Jesus isn't only for a certain segment of the world. Jesus has come to all the world. And we read, do we not, in the book of Philippians, that one day every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So after underscoring this lesson for us, we come to another part of our story. And um, in this part of the story, again, we're going to get another glimpse about who Jesus is really. And I, I just want to set the stage for this story by reading to you from Matthew chapter 16, verses 1 through 4. It says here that the Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. Isn't that interesting? They want another sign. How many signs has Jesus given already? All the way back to the, the first real out, um, you know, outpouring of Jesus' ministry back in Matthew chapter 4, did not the crowds come from Jesus all over the region? He healed lepers, he heals the blind, he heals the lame, he, he raises the dead, he walks on water, he multiplies bread and fish and feeds thousands. It, it should make you pause in your spirit and say, what's really going on here? Do they really want a sign? Notice here it says, the Pharisees now, usually we've been reading that the Pharisees are teaming up with the teachers of the law. Now you are introduced to another group. They're called Sadducees. In a, in a simple way, let me just say, like the Pharisees really had the heart of the people. They were the common man's, you know, leader. The Sadducees, well, they were usually um, um, part of the movers and shakers. They were historians will, that write back in this period give us insight into the, the political nature of the Sadducees. But there were some real differences between these two groups. They didn't just hang out. There was tension between Pharisees and Sadducees. And I could go on and, and talk about that, but I'm just going to use one verse to give you an example of this that's found in your, in your Bibles. In the book of Acts, in chapter 22 and verse 8, notice what it says here. It says that the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection and that there are neither angels nor spirits. But the Pharisees acknowledge them all. There's some real doctrinal differences here, isn't there? Paul would say to us in 1 Corinthians 15 that if, if Jesus Christ has not, raised, was, has not been raised from the dead, then you and I are still in our sin. Because Jesus died for our sin and was raised again for our justification. So if that never really did happen, if we're going to just excuse that and just say, well, it doesn't really matter. It, what really matters is that Jesus is a good person. No, it, it definitely is at the foundational, you know, uh, platform on which all of Christianity is built. If Jesus did not ri rise from the dead, then you and I are still in our sin. And people want to make the ministry of Jesus into something that it is not. He came to give his life a ransom for many. He came to be that lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world. By his blood, you and I have been made clean. And you can't remove that. And so don't you see, like Pharisees and Sadducees, they're... They both might appear to be religious and people are looking to them, but at the core, man, there's some really big differences there. So to find them teaming up, it's why? Because they find that they have a common villain now. It's Jesus. The Pharisees don't like him because Jesus isn't really kowtowing to them. 
He's not, he's not paying attention to the tradition of their elders. He's not following all of their rules. In fact, he turns around and says, your rules are nullifying the very word of God. You're, you're tying burdens on people's shoulders that they can't possibly carry. And the Sadducees, they're not ready to relinquish any kind of power or authority. And so they find in Jesus this, this common enemy. So they're coming together to do what? Look what the text says. It says to test him. That's what it just said, right? In, in verse 1, it says they came to Jesus to test him. So they've already now, you know, kind of played their hand. They're, they're over here seeking to discredit Jesus. It's a, just a pretense for all of their rebellion against him and their scheming. We've learned already, have we not, going back in, 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 in Matthew's gospel, that they've already begun to plot on how they're going to kill Jesus. So this is, this is really, you know, getting hotter and hotter. But the idea of asking for a sign, is that really a terrible thing? I mean, you want proof, right? The problem is that Jesus has been given them proof. The whole Sermon on the Mount was Jesus demonstrating his knowledge of the Scriptures. Jesus saying to the crowd, don't think that I have come to abolish the Scriptures, right? I haven't come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Not the, slight, not the least stroke of a pen, not the smallest letter is going to be done away until all things are accomplished. So Jesus isn't undermining the word of God. In fact, he's, he's, an, he's you know, enforcing it. And that was authority then that he spoke to the people with, and they were amazed. But then he also demonstrated authority in his word, in his work doing things that the people themselves would say, we have never seen such things done in Israel. Blind people seeing? Crippled people being able to walk? But they didn't, those signs weren't good enough? Now, I get the idea of signs. Don't you remember Moses? Moses? When God called Moses at that burning bush and says, Moses, I want you to go and lead my people out of Egypt. And Moses came with all kinds of objections, right? And then what does he say to God? He goes, all right, all right, all right. If I go and they say, who sent you? Who am I going to say sent me? And God says, you tell them, I am sent you. And so that they will know that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the one who has sent you. God did all those miracles, right? He gave them this staff, and God began to, to, to speak into Moses' life and reveal to him how he was going to unfold his plan. And every one of those plagues, every one of those acts was a way that God was just putting another straw on the backs of the, of, the, of the Egyptians until finally they just could take it no more. And Israel, without an army, is led out of Egypt. Uh, what about Gideon? Gideon, it said, was to fight against the armies of Midian. And the, and the text tells us in the book of Judges that the Midianites were, were, were so numerous, they were like trying to count the grains of sand in the desert. And, 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 and God says, Gideon, I want you to go deliver them because this is a sure thing. And Gideon turns around and says, all right, all right. But just so that I can feel a little bit more comfortable, can you do me a favor? Can you just... I'm going to take my jacket off here, and I'm going to put it on the ground, and when I wake up in the morning, everything should be wet, and my jacket will be, would dry, be dry. And God says, sure, sure, whatever. 
He wakes up and he sees it, and then he goes, oh, all right, all right, all right. But just to make sure that I'm not missing this, how about if you do it in reverse? The jacket's wet and everything else is dry. <laughs> like, we're talking about God. God is interacting with humanity, us, and all of our frailty, all of our questions. Honestly, if you were God, don't, don't you see how this is like a game that is being played between an adult and an infant? And that little infant, you know, it is, it, it's so, you know, um, absorbed in their own little world, they have no idea that you can do what you can do as an adult. And here we are pointing our little fingers back up to God, and God's just smiling, saying, sure, whatever. It should be enough for you that I give you my word. But you want a sign, here's a sign. He did it for Elijah too, right? I mean, I could keep on going. I mean, there's just a thousand and one examples in the scriptures. So nothing wrong with the sign. What makes it wrong is the motivation of the hearts of the people that were asking. And here's the other thing. We are engaged in a spiritual war, are we not? It says the God of this age is seeking to kill and to destroy. Jesus says, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundant. So there is this conflict that is taking place. And that's not just in the days of Jesus. That has been since the Garden of Eden. Can I bring you back to a passage here that's found in Deuteronomy chapter 13? This speaks about spiritual warfare. Listen to what it says. This is Moses speaking now to the children of those who are about to inherit the promised land. He says, if a prophet or one who foretells by dreams appears among you and announces to you a miraculous sign or wonder. And if the sign or wonder of which he has spoken takes place. And then he says, let's follow other gods, gods you have not known. Let us worship them. You must, you must not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer. The Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love him with all your heart and with all your soul. So you see, it wasn't just about the sign, was it? It was about an allegiance that we have to the God who has revealed himself as a creator of heaven and earth, the giver and of life, the one who holds man's destinies in his hands, who turns the hearts of kings and puts boundaries around nations, who looks to the future and sees it as if it were from the beginning. Now, there is a conflict in the world, and sometimes it we find it strange. There is this spiritual war that's taking place. So it's not just about the sign. It's about an allegiance to the one who says, he alone is God. That's why Jesus would remind us this in Matthew 24, 24. This is going to come in a few more weeks as we look at these passages. But this is Jesus speaking to the crowds, and he says, for false Christs, right? For people who are claiming to be Messiah, redeemers, saviors, false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. So there is, there is this conflict in the world that's always trying to get your attention, always trying to provide a seed of doubt so that we walk away from the one who has promised to give us life. So don't you see like what's going on here now with the Pharisees and Sadducees and their testing of Jesus, asking for a sign 
It was so that they would turn the hearts of people away from the very Messiah that has come to bring them life. It's like Jesus saying to them, what are you looking for? Because here I am. But you're unwilling to come to me. So Jesus then turns around and says, okay, so I'm not what you're looking for, but what are you looking for? How observant are you? And I say that because look at Matthew chapter 16, the next couple of verses. Jesus then says, when evening comes, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, today it will be stormy, for the sky is red and overcast. He says, so you know then how to interpret the appearance of the sky. But you cannot interpret the sign of the times. See, as a people, we can be very observant about, you know, the material universe around us, right? through, you know, uh, the scientific method, right, of putting forth, you know, a, um, uh, you know, a, um, uh, an idea, an hypothesis, and then framing up tests to prove whether or not this is true or not. And so people's knowledge of the human body, the, uh, the knowledge that we have of the planet, the so many ways in which life has demonstrated you know, that it has shown advancements, right? All of which because God has given us a brain. We have powers of observation. We test these things. But there are some things that don't fit so easily under a microscope. People want to make this like, well, I believe in science. And and I'm like, okay, well then, can you put hatred under a microscope? How about love? How about grace? You may be able to observe it in action, right? But in its substance, like, how do you find it? There's a lot to life that can't be put under a microscope. The scientific method is great for material things. But for the matters of the heart, Jesus is saying, yeah, you guys, you would do all this observation And you can draw some conclusions, but you can't interpret the signs of the times. He says, you have eyes to see and interpret your surroundings, but you are blind to what is taking place around you. And why is he saying that? Because if you've been following along in this gospel, then you recognize that Jesus says, look, I've come showing a fidelity to to the very word of God. I have come fulfilling all of the Old Testament prophecy that was written about me and about what the Messiah would do. I am authority on display in word and in deed. But you want to impugn my motives. You go around spreading lies about me. You're telling people that I do these things through the power of the devil. You're blind, and you can't see. And there's a reason for that, because something else has captured their attention. And what is that? What's captured their attention? Well, look here in verse 4. It says, Jesus says, you are a wicked and adulterous generation that looks for a miraculous sign. But none will be given except the sign of Jonah. And then Jesus drops the mic and walks off. He left them, went away. He basically put the focus on what is capturing their attention. He calls them wicked and adulterous. That's an echo, really, of 
<laughs> you could go back to so many of the prophets, but being that we've been talking a little bit this, uh, today about Moses, can I show you a text that's found in Deuteronomy 32? It says they have, this is Moses speaking about the people of his day. He says, they have acted corruptly towards him. To their shame, they are no longer his children, but a warped and crooked generation. Why? Because they've already demonstrated the inclination of their heart is not to conform to the will and purposes of God. It's to forge their own way, to do their own thing. And that's always a dangerous place because whatever comes out of the heart is what's going to condemn a man. And if your heart is unredeemed, then it's just going to give voice to your passions. Until the Spirit of God gets a hold of you, and then all of a sudden now you begin to see with a little more clarity these words of wicked and adultery, they're picked up on other places in the New Testament. Jesus says it plainly here. This is, this is what's capturing your attention. Your own passions is what's consuming you. Consider this. There's a passage in James chapter 4, verse 4. He says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? See, that's at the crux of why Jesus calls them an adulterous generation, because they're chasing after other lovers. They're chasing after other gods. It could be fame. It could be money. It could be, you know, um, you know, um, just fill in the blank. <laughs> Whatever it is that's taking your heart and your mind away from serving God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength can become an idol in your own life. That's why James says, listen, you are an adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. That's what James is saying to the people in his day. Because we have to have some clarity. Jesus is looking at these Pharisees and Sadducees who are seeking to undermine him. And in so doing, they're bringing so much destruction to the people that are following after them. See, we have to be careful that our hearts are in sync with God's. And I know this is a constant fight. It's not like one day you wake up and you go, ah, I've arrived. Now you could do that if one day you were waken and you find yourself in heaven, because then the fight is over. But in this life, it's gonna be a constant fight. Every day, we're going to have to say no to this will and yes to God's. Look what it says here in Romans 12, verses 9 and 10. After Paul gives a very reasoned argument why we are justified by faith in the work of Jesus on the cross... He says there ought to be some fruit that is manifested because of this. And what does he say? He says, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. You read that text. That's the woke anthem right there. that your love needs to be sincere. How many times people express love in the days in which we're living and it's very insincere? That kind of love is a love that is manipulative, that it only has as its real object my desires, not the desire of another. And here it says you are to hate what is evil 
We live in a day and an age where people are very skeptical about calling something evil. God doesn't have that kind of hesitation. He's straight up telling us what is evil. But do we have eyes to hear it? No, we know better than God. So if you're to hate what is evil and cling to what's good, do you even know what good is? Because, see, we could be living in this world right now that is vying for our attention on so many different levels that we wind up hating what is good and clinging to what is evil. Demonstrating that at the core of one's heart, it could be wicked and adulterous. Because we're not really searching after the things of God so that he could reform me from the inside out. You know what's interesting is that Jesus then says, there's no other sign that's going to give you except for the sign of Jonah. That's a very interesting thing. Like, when you hear about the story of Jonah, what do you think about? Don't you think about the story of the great fish that swallowed up Jonah, and he was in the belly of that fish for three days until finally he was regurgitated up on the beach somewhere? You do realize that God orchestrated all of that. Because Jonah was running away from God. So God brings this fish and swallows Jonah, who threw himself overboard rather than do what God was asking him to do. But God showed grace and gave him another opportunity. And the next thing you know, he's out there preaching to the Ninevites. What is now Iran. And the people heard the message and they repented. And you would think the prophet would be so happy, but he was angry. And he would tell God, he says, see, this is exactly why I didn't want to do this, because I know that you are forgiving and gracious. See, Jonah wasn't that compassionate and gracious. He, he he wanted Nineveh to be judged. So where's the where's the lesson in this then? When when I when I asked you, I said, look, what is it that is captivating? you know, them right now. It was all about them. And Jesus says, no, I want to tell you something that should be captivating you, and it's in this story of Jonah. It is true that as Jonah was in the belly of that fish, Jesus says, so is the Son of Man going to be in the belly of this earth for three days and three nights, and then he will be resurrected. When Jonah came out of that fish and walked up on the shores of, of, that, uh, of, that, you know, uh, of that land and began to preach, the people responded. Do you not, are you capturing this? Jesus is saying, I'm going to be resurrected from the dead. And my resurrection is going to be preached to all the nations and all the people. This hope, then, is going to be this, that whoever believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live, because I am the resurrection and the life. The sign of Jonah was a sign that God says, out of the redemption that came, the people repented and were saved. Jesus is saying, you want a sign? 
then wait for this sign because the sign is going to be the Son of Man who is going to resurrect from the dead and that name of Jesus is going to be preached to all the world and it's going to bring salvation to all those who embrace it. Whoa. Those Pharisees and Sadducees, they were going to have to wait for that day. But when Jesus comes out of that tomb, it got the attention of Nicodemus, a Pharisee. It got the attention of Paul, right? Who was a Pharisee? Yeah. It changes everything. See, the passage is addressed to those who claim to have a relationship with God, Pharisees and Sadducees. But their actions were showing something totally different. Jesus says, you're you're looking for a sign. I'm going to give it to you. It's going to be my resurrection. It's a game changer. How does what you're looking for reflect God's will and agenda? How much time do you spend examining your attitudes and your behaviors? What really is capturing your attention? Because it can't be what everybody else is doing wrong. That's easy. We live in this world now. Everybody's doing that to everybody. But Jesus wants to begin with you. And he's saying, I need to know what's going on inside of you. Can I give you one last verse here? In 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 This is one of the apostles, John, who no doubt was in this crowd when Jesus is doing all these teachings. And now in reflection, the apostle John writes down, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful men, the lust of his eyes, the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. But the world and its desires will pass away. But the man who does the will of God will live forever. What Jesus is saying to the Sadducees and the Pharisees is I'm the sign. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no man is going to come to the Father but by me. You could cling to all of your ambition. You can cling to all of your authority, but the things of this world are going to pass away. And at the end of your days, you're going to stand before a holy God who has given you life, and you're going to have to give an account. And the only thing that is going to transport you from this world into the one to come is that you know Jesus. Savior, the Lamb of God who has taken away the sins of the world. He's greater than the preaching of Jonah.
He's the author and finisher of life. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for this word. I want to thank you that it challenges us to not think of petty things. Lord, we live in a world that's broken, so why should it surprise us that broken people act in horrific ways? What should get us all excited and exercised is when brothers and sisters who know Jesus act that way. Oh, Lord, we are to let our light shine in the midst of this darkness. We are to demonstrate in word and in action our devotion to you. And that is seen in the way in which we engage one another. That's where the battle rages. I pray, Lord, that you would give us that kind of heart and mind. That your grace will prove to be sufficient. And that we would not grow weary, but run this race marked out for us. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.